Welcome to Rebuilding a Stuart Model's Twin Launch Steam Engine. This is part 4, cleaning and painting and fitting the piston rings. But before I do all that, I just need to make sure that these bearing top caps are in the correct place. A couple of them are interchangeable and it's very difficult to see which goes where. What I have to do is try the crankshaft in position on each of them and that tells me which is which. And once I find out which top cap goes where, I'm just making a small mark to identify the positions of these top caps. Some people stamp numbers on the parts, I really hate that, I don't like to see it. So I'm just making a couple of marks with a small drill and these marks will not be visible to anyone other than a future rebuilder. The next thing to do is to remove the newly identified top caps and clean them up. I'm using a brass wire brush to remove all the paint. And this removes most of the paint very successfully without doing a great deal of damage to the top caps. I then polished up the top caps on my polishing spindle and I didn't go mad, I didn't round the edges, I just wanted to clean them up because I'm not going to paint these. I'm going to put them in the plastic box out of the way so I don't lose them and very soon they will hold the new crankshaft that I haven't yet made in place. Time to remove the entire assembly from the baseboard. The baseboard's not terribly good but it'll do for the moment and I'm being very careful not to lose any of the bolts or the washers or the nuts so they can all go back in place when the engine is ready for reassembly. Even though this baseboard for the engine is just a piece of plywood, it's quite well made. So what I may do is repair it and clean it up, veneer it and then put it all back together. I like to keep as many original parts as possible. This clip shows me starting the clean up process of the casting. I'm being very thorough with this. I'm using some lacquer thinners or cellulose thinners as we call it in the UK to remove any loose paint and it's cleaning up quite well. The owner of the engine has requested that I paint the engine black and it's going to look quite nice. Anything looks good when it's black and gunmetal. Black and brass is a great combination. So what I'm doing here is stirring the paint and I stirred it for a good bit longer than I'm showing on the video. And now of course there is a caution. The following video clips show high speed images of painting. I don't want anyone to get too excited about this. I'm using Humbrol Satin Black as you saw in the previous clip. I'm painting the underside of the casting first because should I get any runs, which is likely because I'm putting quite a good coat on here, it will not run onto the top surface of the engine bed plate. I'm really not worried about runs at this stage because this is the first coat and any runs can be easily dealt with with some wet dry sandpaper. I'm wiping off the excess though, I don't want paint everywhere on the bed plate. I started off using this satin black because I think it's going to look better in a satin finish. But if by any chance when it dries it looks horrendous, then I'll use ordinary Humbrol black enamel. Either way, it's going to look nice in black. But I'm going to leave the top surface of the gunmetal base in gunmetal, because it's going to look really good that way. If I paint everything black, it's going to look a bit messy. I don't know why this is, but these Stuart twin launch engines almost always have the top surface of the gunmetal left unpainted. This video is slightly deceptive at this stage. It looks like I'm really putting too much paint on. And I'm not, because it was very cold in the workshop when I painted this, and it took a while for the paint to thin out on the work itself. I will reserve judgment until I see it once the paint's dried. But for the moment, that's the painting done on the bed plate, or at least the first coat. So I'm going to put it out of the way so it doesn't pick up any dirt and filth off the bench. And the best place for this is on its original mounting base, which is on top of the red box containing the parts. I'll just leave the camera on this for a moment so you can see the paint drying. That's enough of that for now, I'm going to work on some other parts of the engine. These are the lower cylinder covers, and the first thing to do is to remove what's left of the old graphited yarn, because I'm going to replace it with some new stuff. I'm going to replace it with some new old stock, because I do not like the modern graphited yarn. And just in case any experts are hovering over the keyboard, yes, I am aware that I can use O-rings instead of graphited yarn, but I'm not going to do. I'm going to use graphited yarn. And now it's back to the painting. First of all, the lower cylinder covers and then the top covers. But really, I'm not happy about this. I'll stop it. Normally, I would never paint cylinder top covers or cylinder lower covers because I don't think they should be painted. They're often not painted on the full size. And the only reason I'm actually painting these is because they were painted in the first place. So it's now time to use my own painting brush and remove the paint. I really don't like it in black. In fact, I didn't like them in green to start with. So what I'm about to do, now I've removed the black paint, is remove the green paint, which I can't unpaint because it's well stuck to the metal. 
So I put the parts in cellulose thinners to soften the paint and then I used some Scotch-Brite to remove the paint. And after polishing one of the parts on the polishing spindle, it looks much better. Once I knew it was going to work with the first part, I then carried on with the rest. And the longer I left the parts in the cellulose thinners, the easier it was to remove the paint. Health and safety warning, always use cellulose thinners or any other strong solvent in a very well ventilated area. After polishing the top cylinder covers, they look like this, but that's not right. So I used some Scotch-Brite to get rid of the shine. And if you look at some photographs on the internet of full-size steam engines, you will see what I mean. That's it for the painting for the moment. I'm going to have a look at the pistons. These pistons appear to be quite well made, but the problem is that the piston rings supplied with the engine don't fit in the grooves. Well, they do, but they're too tight, and you cannot have piston rings in a groove that are really tight. To fix this, I put the pistons one at a time in my small Boxford lathe and using a very sharp carbide tip tool, I removed a very tiny amount from the inside edge of the groove. And then returning to the bench, when I try the piston rings in the pistons now, they fit perfectly. There's no shake and there's just about enough friction to hold them in place. They fell out of course because they would do because I was making a video. So the next job is to lubricate the piston thoroughly with some steam oil and fit the piston rings. And this is a very tedious job. Or it can be if you break the piston rings. No, it's really not that bad. You just have to be very gentle, yet firm at the same time. Cast iron has very limited bendability, if there's such a word. Some viewers may be thinking, how did he know how much to take off the piston? For me, there's definitely more than one answer to this. I could have used micrometers and tested the thickness of the piston and the thickness of the flanges and the thickness of the two rings together and done some mathematics but in the end I'd just use witchcraft because it's quicker and more fun. Or of course the real reason is the fact that I've been doing this sort of thing for about 45 years as a hobby so I sort of have a good feel for it. And if you watch what I'm doing at the moment I'm very carefully fitting the piston ring I'm labouring the point a little bit for the video to be honest but as you can see I'm able to rotate the piston and the rings float in the groove and there's no side slop or nothing to speak of. So this piston is ready to go into the cylinder. There's just one variable that I am worried about. So while I fit the rings to the other piston, I'll tell you what I'm worried about. When I received this engine from the owner, it was in pieces. It was just a box of bits. And the piston rings were there, but they weren't fitted to the pistons, for obvious reasons they were too tight. But I'm a little worried, and it really is what I thought it was going to be, the piston rings are too tight to fit in the bore. So what I'm about to do, in the next episode perhaps, is have a look and make sure that the bore is the right size. One assumes the piston rings are one inch in diameter, but if the bore is a little bit under that, I'm going to have to ream it out so that they fit. If the pistons are tight in the bore on an engine of this size, then you have a problem because by the time you run in the pistons, other parts of the engine are worn out, like the big ends and the little ends and the crosshead, so it's a good idea to try and get it right to start with. For the moment I'm going to remove the piston that fits in this one cylinder and revisit this later. That's all for now, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.